पीस टीवी द सोल्यूशन फॉर ह्यूमैनिटी السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ مے دا پیس بلیسنگز اینڈ مرسی آف اللہ سبحانہ تعالیٰ بی این آل آف یو آئی ڈاکٹر محمد نائک آئی ایم یور کوآڈینیٹر فار دس پروگرام ٹو بی ٹیلی کاسٹ لائیو آن پیس ٹی وی اینڈ ان شاء اللہ آن ادر چینلز لیٹر آن بفور وی اسٹارٹ دا پروگرام آئی پریفر ٹو گیو یو آل اے بیک گراؤنڈ آف ہاؤ دس ایونٹ has come about. The president of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, invited Dr. Zakir Naik as one of the leading personalities who could put forward proper views on the topic Islam and the 21st century before the prestigious debating society, the Oxford Union, which is famous since 1823 for promoting debates and discussions on vital topics of concern, not only in the Oxford University and its campus, but across the globe. Dr. Zakir Naik will, inshallah, join a host of internationally famous speakers, including current Prime Minister David Cameron, former British Prime Ministers Tony Blair, Margaret Thatcher, and Winston Churchill, U.S. Presidents Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, scientist Albert Einstein, and famous personalities like Malcolm X, the Dalai Lama, Prince Charles, and Mother Teresa, and film stars including Clint Eastwood, Pierce Brosnan, Stephen Fry, and pop star Michael Jackson, who have addressed the Oxford Union in areas of their concern. This dialogue and debate is going to be a very free and open affair and will, inshallah, be telecast live, moment to moment, across the globe over Peace TV and Peace TV Urdu. May I request the technical people to go ahead to Mr. James Langman, President of the Oxford Union, to take over and coordinate and conduct the proceedings of this historic debate of the Oxford Union, the address by Dr. Zakir Naik on the topic, Islam and the 21st century. Tonight, we continue the society's proud tradition of inviting and hosting some of the world's leading figures to address us. We exist as a society to promote debate and the discussion of ideas, and tonight is no exception. I urge all of you here this evening to make full use of the question and answer session that will happen later on tonight. With that said, I now ask you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Zakir Naik to address the society. الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ و علی وصاب اجمین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا ایوہ الناس و ان خلق ناق من ذقین و انسا و جل ناقم شعو بو و قبا الہ لطارف و ان نقل مقمند اللہ یتکاکم ان اللہ علیم الکبیر رب شالی صدری و اسلی عمری 
wahlu al-ugdata min lisani yafqahu qawli honorable mr president of the oxford union mr james langman the honorable members of the oxford union the respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of almighty god be on all of you it's an honor and a great pleasure for me to address this historic oxford union and i would like to thank the oxford union especially its president mr james langman for making this event possible the topic of my talk today is islam and the 21st century islam comes from the root word salam which means peace it's also derived from the arabic word salm which means to submit your will to almighty god islam in short means peace acquired by submitting our will to almighty god and any person who submits his will to almighty god he is called as a muslim many people have a misconception that islam is a new religion which came into existence 400 years ago and prophet muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of this religion in fact islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and prophet muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of almighty god the religion of islam is based on the teachings of the glorious quran which came into existence 1400 years back is it possible that today the humanity at large in this 21st century can gain guidance how a life should be led from a book which is 1400 years old but natural the answer obviously is no if this book is written by human being but the glorious quran is the last and final revelation of almighty god which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him the glorious quran is the proclamation to humanity it is the fountain of mercy and wisdom it's a guide to the erring it's a warning to the heedless it's an assurance to those in doubt it's a solace to the suffering and it is a hope to those in despair the glorious quran is the last and final revelation of almighty god which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him for any book to claim that it is a word of god for any book to prove that it is the revelation from almighty god it should stand the test of time previously in the olden days it was the age of miracles the glorious quran is the miracle of miracles later on came the age of literature and poetry muslim and non muslim arabic scholars alike they acclaim the glorious quran to be the best arabic literature available on the face of the earth but today if a religious book in a very poetic fashion says the world is flat will a modern man believe in it but naturally the answer is no because today is not the age of literature and poetry today is the age of science and technology so let us analyze whether the glorious quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science according to albert einstein the famous physicist and the nobel prize winner who i am told also addressed this historic oxford union he said science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me remind you the glorious quran is not a book of science s c i e n c e but it's a book of signs s i g n s it's a book of ayats it's a book of verses and the glorious quran has more than 6000 signs 6000 ayats 6000 verses out of which more than 1000 speak about science as far as my talk today is concerned i will only be speaking about scientific facts i will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories which all of us know many a time these theories and hypotheses take u turns 
In the field of astronomy, a few decades earlier, in the 1970s, there were a group of scientists who described how the universe came into existence, for which they got the Nobel Prize. This they called as the Big Bang. And these scientists said that initially our universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation. There was the Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, as well as the earth on which we live. This they called as the Big Bang. This, what the scientists discovered about 40 years back, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where it says, Avalam yaral lazina kafaru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan tarat kifafatak nahuma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang, which the scientists discovered recently, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that he first time proved that the earth on which we live, it is spherical in shape. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Naziat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal ard baad azali ka dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. One of the meaning of dhaha is an expanse and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word dhuya, which means an egg. And today we know the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And if we analyze the Arabic word dhaha, doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the egg of an ostrich is too geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran 1400 years ago says that the earth is geospherical in shape. Previously, we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected and borrowed light. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed the herin, sun, a lamp having its own light and moon having borrowed or reflected light. So the Quran describes the moonlight as borrowed or reflected, which we came to know recently in science. Recently in science means 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, about 29 years back. There I'd learned in science that the sun, though it revolves, it does not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33. It is he who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. And today, recently, a few decades earlier, science has come to know that the sun rotates and takes about 25 days to complete one rotation which has been incorporated in most of the school textbooks throughout the world. There may be certain skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy a few hundred years after the Quran was revealed. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, we learn in the school about the water cycle. How the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into interior, falls down as rain and the water table is replenished. This was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in the year 1580. The Quran too describes the water cycle in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran says the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds join, they move into the interior, they fall down as rain and the water table is replenished and the water cycle is completed. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In 
Surah Noor chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49. In Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9. In Surah Waqiyah chapter number 56, verse number 68 to 70. In Surah Mulk chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and on giving references only in the Quran of the several verses which speak about the water cycle in great detail. In the field of oceanography, there's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that he has let two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, we human beings knew that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. But the commentator of the Quran could not understand what does God Almighty mean by saying that these two waters, when they meet, they do not mix and there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This today science calls as the transitional homogenizing area, which the Quran refers to as barzakh, as a barrier. And this can be seen in Cape Point, the southern most tip of South Africa. And when we see even the color of the water between these two types of water differs. And Professor Hay, a very famous oceanologist, he said that this information came to the human knowledge recently. This book, the Quran, it's difficult to explain how does it mention 40 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says every living thing is made from water. Who could have believed in it? Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that every living being, it contains cells. And the basic substance of cell is the cytoplasm, which contains about 80% water. Today, science tells us that every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants have got sexes male and female. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that it is he who sends down water from the sky and with it brings diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Arabic word azwaj, meaning pair, saying that the plants have got sexes male and female. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, it is he who has made every animal that walks on the earth and every bird that flies in the air to live in communities like the human beings. Today, science agrees that even the animals and the birds live in communities like the human beings, which was not known earlier. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabud, chapter number 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle and the communication of ants in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69, that from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for mankind. It is recently we have come to know that the honey that we have is obtained from the belly of the bee. And today science agrees that there are mild antiseptic properties in honey and it is even a healing for mankind. In the field of physiology, the Quran describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 66. 600 years after the Quran was revealed, Ibn Nafis, he made it known to the world about the production of milk and blood circulation. 400 years later, that is 1000 years after the Quran was revealed, William Harvey, he made it famous to the Western world. 
we hear about William Harvey, but we hardly hear about the name of the Nafis, who 400 years before William Harvey spoke about the blood circulation and the production of milk. In the field of embryology, the Quran describes the various embryological stages of the human development in great detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. It says that the human we were nutfa, then we made it into an alaka, a mudga, a zama, that human being is created from a minute quantity of fluid. Then it made it into alaka, that is a leech-like substance, then made it into a chewed-like lump, then made it into bones, then clothed the bones with flesh. When this verse was showed in the early part of the 1980s to Dr. Keith Moore, who at that time happened to be the highest authority in the field of anatomy and embryology. He was the head of the department in the University of Toronto. He said that the description of the Quran is far superior to what modern embryology describes today instead of stage one, two, three. And he said that it's not possible that any human being can mention these things in the Quran. This Quran has to be the word from Almighty God, and he has no objection in accepting Prophet Muhammad as the messenger of Almighty God. Time does not permit me to speak a lot about science. I'll just give one more example which is mentioned in the Quran. The Quran mentions in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4, that when the unbelievers say that how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bones after we are dead, we are buried, our bones have got disintegrated. On the day of judgment, how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bones? Almighty God replies in the Quran and says, tell them, Almighty God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the fingers. What does Quran mean by saying, God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the fingers. It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold, he discovered the fingerprinting method. And he said that no two fingerprints, even in millions of people, are identical. And today, this fingerprinting method is used by the police to identify the criminal. It's used by CIA, by FBI, by the police worldwide. This Quran mentions 1400 years ago. Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, he said, Little knowledge of science makes a person an atheist. But in-depth knowledge of science makes a person a believer in God. That is the reason today scientists are not eliminating God, they are eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. I started my talk by quoting a verse from Surah Quran, from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49. Verse number 13 we says, which means, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Almighty God is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it's not sex, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not age, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it's piety, it is righteousness. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being is by righteousness and by piety and no other criteria. Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 22, amongst the signs he has created the heavens and the earth and the variation in your languages and color. These are signs for the people who understand. The Quran says he has created the different variation in the color and the languages so that those who are knowledgeable people, they will know it's a sign from Almighty God. This speaks about the universal brotherhood. That Almighty God has created all the human beings from a common pair of human beings, Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. And Almighty God says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70. karamna bani Adama, And we have honored the children of Adam. Almighty God says in the Quran that all the children of Adam, irrespective whether they're black or white, male or female, whether they're born in UK or India or USA, whichever part of the world they belong to, Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam, all the human beings. 
And Islam does not only speak about universal brotherhood, it practically demonstrates that every Muslim who follows the religion of Islam should practically practice it minimum five times in the day. I'm talking about one of the pillars of Islam, that is Salah, which is the prayer. And a beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, said that when you stand for prayer, you should stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether the person standing next to you is black or white, rich or poor, king or pauper, when you stand for prayer, you have to stand shoulder to shoulder. This demonstrates the universal brotherhood every day, minimum five times a day. And another example is Hajj which is one of the pillars of Islam, that every rich person who has the means and who has the health to travel to Makkah for the pilgrimage should at least do it once in his lifetime. And Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world, where about three to four million people from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from India, from Malaysia, from different parts of the world, they gather together in one place in Makkah and Arafat, and they are dressed in two pieces of unsewn cloth, which is white in color. You cannot identify the person standing next to you as king or pauper. And all of them come on a common statement. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here we are, oh my Lord, here we are at your service. Islam practically demonstrates universal brotherhood. Many religions believe that humankind has been created from a single pair of Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them both. But there are some religions who put the blame only on Eve for the downfall of humanity, for the origin of sin. But if you read the Quran, the blame for disobeying Almighty God is equally put on both Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. The Quran says in Surah Araf chapter 7, verse number 19 to 27, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they are both addressed more than a dozen times. Both of them, they disobeyed God. Both of them repented and both were forgiven. The blame is equally put on both of them. There is not a single verse in the Quran which puts the blame only on Eve. However, there's one verse in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 121, which says, and singles out Adam, peace be upon him, and says he disobeyed God. But on the whole, if you read the Quran, the blame is equally put on both of them. There are some religions who because they say that woman is the cause of the downfall of humanity, which Islam doesn't agree, some religions say because of that, God punished her. And pregnancy is a curse and punishment of God on the woman. But in Islam, pregnancy uplifts the woman. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was the weaning. The Quran repeats the message in Surah Aqaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15. We have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. In pain did the mother bear them, and in pain did she give them birth. So pregnancy uplifts a woman, does not degrade her. And a beloved prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari is one of the collections of the authentic sayings of the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, in the book of manners, chapter number two, hadith number two, a man approaches the prophet and asks him that who deserves the maximum companionship and love in this world? Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The prophet repeated, your mother. The man asked after that who? Again the prophet said, your mother. The man asked for the fourth time after that who? Then the Prophet said, your father. That means 75%, three-fourth of the companionship goes to the mother, 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam which we have to agree. And if we analyze Islam, gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. 1400 years ago, Islam gave right to any adult Muslim woman to own or disown the property without the permission of anyone else. The first time the Western world gave right for a woman to own or disown property was in 
1870s under the Married Women Property Act, which said that a married woman, adult, can own or disown the property without the permission of the husband. And this act was later revised. Islam gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. And in Islam, we do not agree with the word housewife, which is used in English language, because we don't consider the woman to be married to the house, to be called a housewife. We prefer calling her as homemaker, the person who makes the home, the person who builds the home. Though we see that there are many misconceptions, and many people think that men and women in Islam are not equal. In fact, in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. They're equal, but they are not identical. Depending upon the physiological makeup, their psychological makeup, their biological makeup, they have different roles. Overall, men and women are equal in some aspects. The woman, she may have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men may have a degree of advantage. Let me give you an example. If there are two students in a class, student A and B, both of them, they come out first in examination. Both get 80 out of 100. When we analyze the answer sheet, the 10 questions, which have 10 answers, each carrying 10 marks. In answer to question number one, student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 9 out of 10. In answer to question number two, student B gets 9 out of 10, and student A, he gets 7 out of 10. In all the remaining eight answers, both get 8 out of 10. If we add up, both get 80 out of 100, they're equal. But in answer number one, the student A has a degree of advantage. In answer number two, student B has a degree of advantage. In the other aspects, both are equal. And overall also they're equal. In the same way, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. For example, if a robber, if a thief enters my house, I will not say I believe in woman liberalization. I will not ask my wife or my daughter to go and fight. Since God has given me more strength, it is my duty to fight. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34, that God has given more strength to men. It is his duty to protect the woman. So in strength, the men have a degree of advantage. And the other example I gave earlier, that where companionship of the children is concerned for the parents, the women have three times more companionship as compared to men. The mother has three times more companionship as compared to father. So here, the women have a degree of advantage. So as I said earlier, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. The foundation of the religion of Islam is the belief in one and only sole creator and sustainer. And this creator and sustainer almighty God is the same for all the human beings. Only if you agree that our creator, sustainer and cherisher, one God is the same, then only can brotherhood be maintained in all religions. And this is the basis of all the religions. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means belief in God. If you understand God, you understand that religion in the right perspective. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, kalimatin sawa im baina bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That you worship none but one almighty God. So the Quran says, let the people of different religions come to common terms. What is different, we can discuss tomorrow. Let us agree to follow what is common. And one thing common in all the religion is to believe and worship only one God. To understand any religion, or to understand the concept of God in a religion, it is not appropriate to try and observe the followers of that religion. Because many a time the followers themselves may not be aware about the religion or the concept of the God in religion. The best and the most authentic way of understanding a religion or understanding the concept of God in religion is 
to try and understand what the authentic scriptures of that religion have to speak about God. Let's try and understand the concept of God in the major religions in a nutshell. First, we'll try and understand the concept of God in Hinduism. The two major and most authentic scriptures in the religion of Hinduism are the Vedas and the Upanishad. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. This is a Sanskrit quotation. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nacha se kasij, janitana chadipa. Of that God, he has got no parents, he has got no lord, he has got no father, he has got no mother, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. As well as Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasya patima asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue, an idol. It says, of that God, there is no image, there is no picture, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no statue, there is no idol, there is no sculpture. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekam Brahm Devtya Naste, Nena Naste Kinchan, Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one, not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism and understand Hinduism in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo, Adnahin Adnaikat. Your Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, I am Lord, and there's no Savior besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord, and there's none else, there's no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, Chapter number 46, verse number 9. I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. It's further mentioned in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. As well as in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. Almighty God says, Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism and understand Judaism in the right perspective. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to clarify a few points. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. We believe he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. One may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that many Christians believe, or most of the Christians believe, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. They believe that he was Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. There is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. 
Anyone who says I seek not my will but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. As I mentioned, Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, not my will, but the will of Almighty God. So in Arabic, we say he's Muslim. Therefore, we say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. And he further clarified in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, he said, that the words that you hear are not mine, but my father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, This is life eternal, so that you may know one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says, Amen of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you witnessed to it. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandments, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him, earlier. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo Adna Hainu Abdai Khad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you shall understand the concept of God in Christianity and understand Christianity in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas. That is chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul ho Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. There's nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God. Any person says so-and-so candidate is God. If he passes these four tests, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting as God. The first is, say he's one and only. The second is, he should be absolute and eternal. The third, he begets not nor is he begotten. And fourth, there's nothing like unto him anything in this world. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God, which we call as the litmus test for theology. It is the touchstone of theology. And further, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not, abuse not those gods who they worship besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will revile, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran prohibits any Muslim from speaking bad, from reviling, from abusing, those who other people worship as God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah. So to understand the concept of God in Islam, you have to read the Quran. Today, unfortunately, Islam is the most misunderstood religion in the world. The religion which has the maximum misconception in the world today, it is Islam. And one of the reasons for these misconceptions about this religion, I would say, it is the media. Today we find in the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international newspapers, in the international magazine, on the regular broadcast stations, on the international satellite channels, on the internet, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And the most misunderstood word regarding Islam, it is the word jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the Muslims, because of the media, it's also misunderstood by the non-Muslims. Today, most of the people, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, they think that any war fought by any Muslim, for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for name, whether it be for fame, whether it be for honor, whether it be for land, any war fought by any Muslim is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic we'll say he's doing jihad. 
So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Today, most of the Orientalists, they translate the word jihad as holy war. If you translate holy war into Arabic, it is harbu muqaddasa. And this word harbu muqaddasa appears nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in any things of the Prophet Muhammad This word holy war, if you go back into history, was first used for the Crusades. When the Crusaders, they forced people to accept the religion of Christianity by force. And unfortunately today, it is used for the Muslims and Islam. Quran mentions explicitly in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. The Quran says, if any human being kills any other innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And the verse continues, if anyone saves any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. I, being a student of comparative religion, I have not come across any verse in any scripture besides the Quran which is so explicit against terrorism, against killing innocent human beings. It says that if any human being kills any other human being who is innocent, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And I have not come across any verse in any other scripture, any other religious scripture besides the Quran, which promotes the prevention of terrorism. And it says, if any human being saves any human life, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. Islam condemns all forms of terrorism. Islam condemns the killing of any innocent human being, irrespective of caste, color, creed, irrespective of which nationality he belongs to, irrespective of which religion he belongs to. Islam and I too condemn all forms of terrorism. I also condemn the 9-11, which took place on 11th of September 2001, the Twin Tower bombing in New York, where few thousand innocent people were killed. I condemn the 7-7, 7th of July 2005, London bombing, where more than 50 innocent people were killed. I also condemned the serial train bomb blast that took place in Bombay on the 11th of July 2006, where more than 180 innocent people were killed. I also condemned the Gujarat massacre, the riots which were pre-planned, which took place in Gujarat in India, where innocent few thousand Muslims were killed. I condemn all sorts of terrorism, where innocent human beings are killed, irrespective whether Muslim or non-Muslim. And whatever acts of terrorism which takes the life of innocent human being is to be condemned, including suicide bombing. Now we have, recently in the past few decades, that a person goes, he puts up a bomb, goes in a marketplace, goes in a tube station on the road, and he blows himself up, and with him takes several other human lives. This act is not tolerable in any religion, especially Islam. Suicide bombing where innocent human beings are killed is totally prohibited in Islam. Unfortunately, though Islam is a religion which condemns all sorts of terrorism, all acts of terrorism that took place in the past, which is even taking place in this 21st century, even though it condemns, unfortunately, today, the media portrays Islam as a religion which promotes terrorism. Every community has its black sheep. And I'm also aware that there are black sheep in the Muslim community. What does the media do? The media picks up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they're exemplary Muslims. Because of this today, we find that most of the people think that Islam promotes terrorism. If you read the Quran, if you read the sayings of the Prophet, Islam amongst all the religions is at the foremost in condemning the killing of innocent human beings. And one such prey of the media, of these media tactics, was myself. Eight months back, 
in the fourth week of June 2010, I was supposed to give a series of talk in UK. I was supposed to give a talk in the Wembley Arena in Wembley, London, in LG Arena, NEC Birmingham, as well as Sheffield Arena in Sheffield. All these venues had a capacity of 10 to 15,000 people, and these are prestigious venues. Just three weeks before my lecture tour, there was an article which came in one of the leading newspapers at Sunday Times. Sunday Times, it gave an article, Muslim preacher of hate let into Britain. And this article, it gave portions of my speeches, which were either quoted out of context or they were misquoted. And it portrayed me as a preacher of hate, a person who promotes terrorism. And the next couple of days, the same article was picked up, rehashed and reprinted in many of the newspapers of UK. Not only newspapers of UK, but newspapers internationally, including the newspapers of India. Unfortunately, these articles inspired the Home Secretary of UK, Theresa May, to pass an exclusion order on the 16th of June, 2010. After reading these articles and hearing some clips from the YouTube, which were again, is out of context, and there were portions which were manipulated, based on these YouTube clips, and the media report, the Home Secretary of UK, on 16th of June 2010, she passed an exclusion order against me. And the next day, 17th of June, the Deputy High Commission of Britain in Bombay, on the 17th of June, they revoked and cancelled my visa. I had a valid five years multiple entry visa to UK, which was issued on the 15th of July 2008, valid till 15th of July 2013. I have been coming to UK since the past 20 years. I have come several times and for lecture tours of several times. I had a valid multiple entry five years visa which had come twice before in 2008-2009 which was cancelled without giving me a fair hearing. I think this is an attack on freedom of expression as well as on human rights. Charles Farr, who is the Director General of the Office of security and counterterrorism, he was not in favor of this exclusion order. And he wanted me to reach to those Muslims who he felt the government could not reach. But the Home Secretary, ignoring the advice of her senior most security advisor, she went ahead with the exclusion order. And later on, a few weeks later, she even suspended one of the advisors under Charles Farr, who supported me. I personally have more faith in the judiciary system rather than the political system of my country, India, as well as the country of UK. We did a judicial review and took it to the High Court. Though the Home Secretary said I have no right to file under human rights because I'm a non-UK citizen, Justice Cranston said, and he reviewed it, and he said that he can file a case. And he passed a judgment and said that the first three decisions of the Home Secretary on 16th of June, 17th of June, and the 27th of June, all three were unlawful. But however, later on in the month of August 2010, when they gave additional information, he said that this is lawful, which is not logical. I have faith in the judicial system. We have filed for an appeal against the last judgment of the High Court, and I have full faith that, inshallah, very shortly, this exclusion order would be reversed by the Court of Appeal. I hope in future I may have the chance to meet the Home Secretary Theresa May personally and explain to her the peaceful message of Islam and remove any misconception about Islam or any of my lecture that she may have. I would have personally preferred to come personally in the Oxford Union and give this talk and have a lively question and session rather than the satellite. Last month, I had gone to France. I was in Paris. We had a board meeting of our trust, Islamic Research Foundation International, which is based in UK, as well as Universal Broadcast 
limited. Because I could not come to UK, I called the board members to Paris. And I was shocked. Normally, the world feels that France is more strict against Islam than UK. But when I applied for visa, I got it within one hour. And we had the board meeting there. I prefer having it in UK, but because of the exclusion order, which I feel the Court of Appeal very shortly will reverse it. And though the world may think that because of the exclusion order, it is an attack on freedom of expression. But I would like to thank the Oxford Union that even though an exclusion order has been passed on me, yet they permitted this debate or this lecture for the question answer session. I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially the president, Mr. James Langman, for being bold and agreeing to have this lecture. The Oxford Union may or may not agree with my speech. They may like my talk or may not like my talk. What I appreciate is that they are really people who promote freedom of expression. I would like to conclude my speech by giving a message. Peace is the only solution for the problems of humanity. Many nations, many countries have armies. They've got military, they've got Navy, they've got Air Force. Some countries have weapons of mass destruction. Some have nuclear weapons. Believe me, all these are not the solution for the problems of humanity. The only solution, according to me, for the problems of humanity is peace. There may be differences. There are differences in culture. There are differences in languages. There are differences in color. There's difference of society. Irrespective of the differences, one common factor amongst all human beings of the world is that all want peace. According to me, peace is the only solution for the problems of humanity. I said at the starting of my talk, Islam is derived from the Arabic word salam, which means peace. And this word salam is mentioned in the Quran no less than 43 times. And along with its derivatives, it's mentioned no less than 143 times. Salam, peace, is mentioned in the Quran no less than 143 times. And I started my talk by greeting all of you, Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be on all of you. The Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 58, that peace is a salutation from the Lord who is the most merciful. One of the attributes of Almighty God is As-Salam, the source of peace. Quran says in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 23, it refers to Allah, Almighty God, as As-Salam, the source of peace. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 16, that Almighty God guides those people who come towards Him, towards peace and safety, and takes them out of darkness into light. That's the reason. Every chapter of the glorious Quran, there are 114 chapters in the Quran, every chapter except nine starts with the beautiful formula, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, Almighty God, the most merciful, the most gracious. According to me, peace is the only solution for humanity. And I am a person who spreads peace. My mission is to spread peace. And as many may be aware, that I, started a global peace TV network about five years before, in January 2006. In January 2006, I launched the Peace TV in English. Two and a half years later in 2008, Peace TV Urdu. And inshallah, in the next couple of months, in April 2011, we will launch the Peace TV Bangla. Today, Peace TV English is the largest watched Islamic satellite channel in the world. It has a viewership of more than 100 million, out of which more than 25% are non-Muslim. Even if I'm able to convince one human being, irrespective whether he's a Muslim or non-Muslim, and prevent him from killing one innocent human being, I feel I would have saved the whole of humankind. Peace is the only solution. My message is only of peace. My mission is to spread peace. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said, people who worry 
that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Wa akhru dawan, alhamdulillah, bilalami.